Just to uh, get us started, I wanted to give you a little uh, bit of information about Emory itself so you know the kinds of uh, background uh, and, and places I've been. Uh, no financial relationships to disclose. So Emory School of Medicine, where I am now predominantly, uh, is within the Woodruff Health Sciences Center of the university um, and uh, reports uh, up to our Executive Vice President for Health Affairs. Um, within the Woodruff Health Sciences Center, we have all the professional schools in medicine, School of Public Health, School of Nursing, as well as the Yerkes Primate Center. Um, and then Emory Healthcare is the university-owned healthcare delivery arm that I'll describe a little more in just a few minutes. Uh, a little bit about the medical school. We have 104 GME programs, which becomes pretty mind-blowing to keep track of. A lot of these are very small programs of one and two fellows per year, uh, but many are very large. Uh, we have a total of 1,266 residents and fellows. Um, the med school has 138 per year. The Department of Medicine itself could be a small college. We have uh, nearly 600 clinical faculty and um, 60 research faculty. Uh, we have 173 residents and about 33 fellows in a given year. So we're quite large. Within Emory Healthcare itself, the university owns um, a faculty practice plus five hospitals. Uh, one is an orthopedics and spine hospital, two are large university-based um, uh, hospitals, and then two are more community hospitals. And then we have affiliated health centers, and you probably know that Emory is affiliated with Grady. Grady is the safety net hospital in Atlanta with, a, with about 1,000 beds. Uh, that is uh, the home to both Emory uh, faculty that serve about 80% of the faculty positions, physician positions, and then uh, Morehouse School of Medicine, about 20%. Uh, the VA Medical Center is also a um, prime training ground, as well as the uh, Children's Health Care of Atlanta. These are all three affiliates of uh, the Emory School of Medicine. Um, so my objectives today uh, for the audience, uh, for you all, uh, I want to be able to give you some insight into what I think are ways to help prioritize your opportunities for improvement, uh, to identify the success factors for making improvement happen, um, and then to talk a little bit about the effects of unnecessary variation uh, on healthcare processes. And I'm going to go at this um, by giving you perspectives from my time I spent as the chief quality officer at the Emory University Hospital. Uh, I did that for a decade until this past fall when I transitioned over to the associate dean position at the medical school. Um, I'll also give you some perspectives uh, as an educator in quality improvement over the years. And then we'll go through a few examples of some of the work that we've done at Emory. So starting with the uh, chief quality officer role, um, the, the foundation for this began for me back in about 2006. Uh, so uh, I don't know if the uh, University of Louisville is a member of the University Health System Consortium. You are? Okay. So the UHC, and it's now called Visient, is the largest consortium of academic um, health centers uh, in the country. It comprises about 90% or so of academic health centers, so over 100 uh, contributing members. And uh, one problem that academic health centers have is that it's hard to benchmark uh, against the local uh, marketplace because many hospitals are smaller community hospitals. Academic centers tend to be the tertiary and quaternary referral centers. It's hard to find comparisons. So finally, through UHC, uh, contributing members sent data in, and it allowed the, the members to create a committee to review uh, the data, to do comparisons, and to benchmark. So in 2005, they came out with the first version of their uh, scorecard of quality and, and accountability, they called it. Uh, in 2006, they, they changed the, the methodology a good bit, and since then it's been relatively stable with minor tweaks. So this was the scorecard that came out in 2006. Um, the score is higher is better, and uh, the scores uh, you can see ranged across uh, from the, you know, just above 50 to the upper 60s. Um, when this came out, uh, Emory uh, it thought of itself at the time. We were, we were always trying to rise and set goals. We were probably a top 25 research institution in terms of funding. Uh, the medical school had a great reputation. Uh, and so we thought of ourselves as being, being absolutely stellar. Uh, the trouble was that when the quality data came out, we found ourselves uh, very close to the tail on this, uh, on this ranking system. Uh, and this turned out to be very, very powerful. This galvanized uh, the Board of Trustees in particular um, and allowed us to get our, get our arms around, started getting our arms around what it meant to be a place that delivers high-quality care. 
So the responses to this, our, our chief medical and quality officer at the time was very savvy. Uh, he's still in that position. He got together with the chair of the patient quality committee of the board, and they took this together to the board and said, here's where we are and, uh, and what do we need to do. So the response is, uh, the board set a goal for us by 2012 to be in the top 10. They wanted to be up in that zone with Mayo Clinic, Cedar sinai and others. Uh, so set that goal for us. The trouble was that in about 2006, a lot of other health centers set the same goal. Um, so there was, there was a real race to the top here, but that's good. Competition to improve care is, is a great thing. So we set that as a goal, and then we had to get organized and put some resources into it. So part of what happened was an expansion of capability. We appointed physician quality officers at each of the facilities instead of just having one person for the entire system. And that's how I got my job back in 2006. We also hired a few process engineers uh, to help guide us. Not very many, and we didn't quite know how to use them yet, but we brought them in. Uh, we expanded our data capabilities, and we now have uh, one of the best data warehouses of any place I've seen. Uh, we can answer tremendous numbers of questions, for the, at least for Emory Healthcare, uh, out of our data warehouse. And that uh, information was brought to bear. Uh, we realized, too, that the expertise in the organization was very thin. We needed to expand that. Uh, so, to so to create capacity, uh, a colleague and I developed the Emory Healthcare Quality Academy. We based it on Intermountain Healthcare's training program and have two types of courses. One is a, a mandatory two-day, well, it's a two-day leadership course. It was made mandatory for senior leaders by our CEO. Uh, the dean of the medical school came to the very first class, and he turned around and made it mandatory for um, uh, chairs and division directors. So across the organization, we had about 300 people over a semester go through this two-day course. It really just introduced people to concepts and terminology. We also developed an intensive training course designed to produce people who could independently do quality improvement projects. That's 12 full days over four months. Both of these are still going. We've trained probably a total of 1,400, 1,500 people through one or the other course. Um, and the 12-day course is a project-based one. We also then um, focused intensively on our culture. We knew from other organizations that, that culture matters a great deal when you're trying to do quality improvement. Um, but there were a lot of difficult concepts that we needed to bring together. So our CEO had the foresight to say we could risk confusing people. Let's create something uh, that's a visual diagram to help us walk through this. So this diagram is busy. I'm not going to go through uh, the whole thing. But you see the blue eggs in the middle of this nest. Um, and these five principles uh, were ones that each, each of them has a lot of nuance and detail and methodology to it. But these five principles really guided us. Yesterday in the workshop I gave, it was about disclosure of medical errors, which we would put in the transparency category. Uh, but fair and just culture played big for us, patient-family-centered care, shared decision-making. And for a long time, we had we'd been doing some work on cultural competency and, and diversity because our, our community and our workforce, like yours, is very diverse. Uh, about two years later, something very important got added to this, and it's the light blue ring that includes what we call the pledge. And the pledge is our attempt to express our commitment to each other as peers. How do we treat each other? How do we work together to advance uh, the safety of care uh, and the quality of care? And that's, that's important for our, our foundation. So uh, we, did, we did all these things. We were doing a lot of projects. Um, we had found ourselves improving. And by 2009, had reached this middle tier. But in 2010, we were stagnant. We hadn't moved up any further. And we weren't quite sure what to do next. Again, the vision of our CEO was very powerful. And he brought us together um, by having system-wide uh, executive leadership meetings, about 40 people, a couple of academic chairs, uh, but the chief quality officers, medical officers, financial officers, nurses, um, others were in the room together, our analytics people, in a room together, spending at first three hours every two weeks. And these, dis these meetings were designed to make decisions because we can go around and around trying to make a decision in an academic medical center, uh, often described as having a 1,000 points of veto. Anyone gets a chance to say, I don't want to do that. And we respect each other so much so that we say, okay, well, we're not going to force Dr. Roman to be on board. Um, but here in this room, we made decisions. And I remember one day we 
made a decision in the room to spend a million and a half dollars on hiring care transition nurses uh, to uh, try to affect our readmission rates. Uh, and that was the first time we had, we had been able to commit ourselves uh, in that uh, efficient a manner. So we, we used this technique for a year or two. Uh, we got some good progress out of it. And the learning that came, came out of it made us realize that as we were a growing system, we were having trouble managing the granular details. So our CEO said, you will go forth in your own hospitals and at the clinic and create the same structure. So now we have uh, at every site a weekly meeting of at least an hour where the executive team meets with the people who are called the accountable leads for the, for the uh, uh, most important projects. And there are about 20 projects that each hospital follows. Uh, and the accountable lead is a person. It could be a physician, a nurse, or other. A person who's responsible to know what's going on with this project at any one time. They're usually leading the project. And the purpose of these meetings is not the dog and pony show where you try to make it nice and shiny and impress everyone. The purpose is to come and air the dirty laundry, to say, here's the trouble I'm having making progress. And the executive team is there to say, how can we help you? What barriers can we break down for you? And that's been very, very effective. Uh, so in doing that, I think what we've learned is um, uh, the truth of this quote from Ronald Heifetz, attention is the currency of leadership, well known in the business world. But what he's saying is that leaders have the ability to bring attention, not just their own attention, but the attention of others to the things that matter. And this is what uh, our CEO was modeling for us. So with that, we were able to progress. And by 2010, one of our hospitals, or 2011, one of our hospitals reached the top 10. And by 2012, we had both in. Our peak year was 2013, where we had positions number two and three out of UHC. Um, and U Emory University Hospital maintained our status in the top 10 for five consecutive years. Now both hospitals are in that second, um, second box there. But uh, we've maintained good focus and good energy. And what we've done now is start to shift our attention away from the things that were driving the scorecard to encompass a lot, of, a lot of other things as well, including trying to remove cost from the system any place we can. So what do I think we can still do better? So we've come... We've had 10 years of good hard work at Emory. What can we do uh, to take the next steps? Well, one thing is that we, we chose in the beginning not to go with a single dominant methodology. Uh, we use the model for improvement with PDSA cycles. We use lean. We have a little bit of Six Sigma. And we did that because we thought each of these tools has a different focus or methods has a different focus that may be useful in different situations. And while I think that served us pretty well, I'm now beginning to see that what we lack really is a coherent management structure and management methodology. We can do improvement work, but you can only get yourself so far with projects. Uh, what we have at the managerial level is we have smart people who've been promoted into manager roles, a lot of whom have had no real training. They're doing the best job they can, but they don't necessarily know how to lead in this environment and lead through data that they're generating uh, regularly in their area. So I think our, our next strategy, hopefully, we're re-engaging with some lean consultants. I'm hoping that we can have the, do the, have the willpower uh, to spread uh, lean through our management structure. Another is we really need to commit to long-term quality improvement infrastructure. I mentioned that we hired some engineers. We did projects. Uh, we found that we weren't um, making the most of their time. Some of them drifted away to other jobs. And um, we were left with just a, a core of one or two people who really were uh, industry experts. So uh, we're now starting to rebuild this, but we still struggle because it's a big budget expense, and we're always trying to be uh, as lean as we can with our budgets. But we need to really commit to uh, more full-time facilitators. Uh, we also need to really get our game together with interprofessional care. We still function politely in our silos, and we interact well with others. As a physician, I know my role. I can step onto almost any unit. I know the roles of the nurses, the respiratory therapist, and others in the outpatient setting. I know what people can do, um, and I know how to interact with them. But really, really high-functioning teams are getting together, evaluating the care they deliver, and working together to improve it. We don't have very many places that do that. And it's critical because otherwise, how are we going to train the next generation to really practice interprofessional care? We talk about interprofessional education a lot, but we're getting people in the room to learn how to be nice to each other as opposed to really getting them out there, working together, improving care. Um, and then I think uh, we, we have more work to do to really get the frontline physicians involved in improving the care they deliver. Bringing data to them that's actionable, 
having the time set aside uh, and the expertise to help get their expert, uh, the physician's expertise and engagement in the improvement work itself. We've got to figure out how to structure that. Uh, so I'm going to shift a little bit now and talk more about the um, educational side of things. Um, some of the pitfalls that we need to address with our education uh, are these. The first is the uh, jumping to solution problem. And uh, let me just describe this to you. We're all in healthcare because we're fixers. We're smart people, whether we're physicians, nurses, or others. We're smart professionals. Uh, we excelled. We were always at the top of our game, on top of our class. Um, and we've got answers. And we think that we can fix it. And so what we get is a lot of shooting from the hip, and uh, let's just go out and do this one thing, and it'll fix the problem. Trouble is that our vision is limited to what we know, and we don't necessarily have the, the tools and time to dig deeply. So what we need to be doing with this is really teaching people the tools and methods to appropriately analyze the problems um, and do it with real-world problems. So much of our education right now is still kind of classroom-based, exercise-based. We need to get people out there learning through projects that they're doing uh, in their workplace. Uh, we also need to be improving outside of our silos. We tend, uh, particularly in education, we tend to have our medical students do some learning. Our nurses have a little bit of curriculum going on. Um, we get to the residents, we do the same thing. Okay, you're, you're in clinic and you've got a project in clinic. It's the residents sitting around the table with their faculty. And what they tend to th come up with are problems that they can understand from their perspective and solutions that they have control over. They think about how they'll do, put up reminders for themselves and change their uh, documentation and um, those, those sorts of things. They're usually not coming up with how can the nurse really make this uh, change happen. How can we offload um, the things that doctors don't really need to do and work as a team uh, to design new solutions? So we need to really do this work within interprofessional teams. And we've had some nice uh, examples of the ability to do that. I'll share you, with you later on. Um, and as a, one of my colleagues likes to say, who's a, a real expert in patient safety, um, he says the best decisions come out of multiple diverse uh, viewpoints offered freely. So having those different perspectives at the table with a culture that says even the lowest ranking person in the room should submit their idea because it may be the best one. Uh, and then we need to get more rigorous about our solutions. We tend to come up with patches of things that we can do quickly that rely on us paying attention. I'm going to remember to do this thing for my patients, to screen better, uh, to do preventive care better, to get the diabetic foot exam done. I'm going to remember those things. Uh, but none of us can remember everything. Um, and really, uh, do we want to be doing that, or do we want to be focusing our attention on what matters to the patient today? and what matters to them long term. So we need to figure out how to get that, that done. And for that, we have to teach the reliability science principles, the human factors engineering that uh, teaches us how to make our care less dependent, particularly the routine care that ought to happen for everybody. How do we make it less dependent on me as the provider to remember to do it? We have to partner also with informatics and have them at the table because so, many, so much of what we do now is dependent on the computer. It has great power to frustrate us, it also has great power to help us. Some of the challenges across the educational continuum uh, for the undergraduate medical education with students, it's still four years, and it's a zero-sum game. Something goes in, it displaces something else in the curriculum. So we have to, have, um, have to figure this out as well. Fortunately, at, Ever at Emory, we've got the attention of the, um, of the curriculum deans and planners and they think this is very important, so they've given us the time to get quality and safety into the curriculum. For the students themselves, uh, I mean, in, in the consortium I'll tell you about later, but um, across the country it's this way. Students tend to ask what's going to be on the board exams. They're focused on that. And while they can appreciate these other topics, um, if it's taking time away from their more immediate concerns, it's an issue. I did a two-hour session with uh, the first-year class in the, in the winter, and uh, the feedback I got was you know, generally very positive, but the uh, most biting uh, criticism was, why did they have to schedule this on an exam week? Right. So, so we have to pay attention to that and figure that out. For graduate medical education, this is a big challenge. Our GME residents and fellows come from all over. It's not just our own students coming up through the ranks. Uh, and we don't know what they've gotten uh, in their education so far. They're also spread out across all of these different programs that are hard to manage. 
and we have relatively few faculty who have any training in this. This is something that really started hitting uh, medical education in the 2000s. So not very many faculty have had uh, experience. We don't really have a standard curriculum at Emory. We do have them do some of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement open school modules as they go through orientation. That's just to give them some terminology and, and concepts. Uh, but they're not learning how to do it then. Uh, and again, most of the projects that I've seen have been these very superficial kinds of projects from these students. Uh, I understand you've had a clear visit so far, or you're thinking about a future visit. Um, we've had this uh, visit for ourselves now twice at Emory. And uh, the first time through, it was very eye-opening. Uh, the uh, clear reviewers asked uh, our residents and fellows, do you know what the health system priorities are? And for our residents and fellows, they go across a lot of platforms. They're at Grady. They're the VA, they can be at Children's, they can be at Emory Healthcare, and they can be at multiple hospitals within Emory Healthcare itself. Do they really know? And, the, and they said, we're not sure what the priorities are. So we've not done a good job making it clear to them and getting them involved with it. Um, and w but when they asked, have you been involved in quality improvement, they generally said, yes, we have. And so then the reviewer said, well, tell us about some of the work you're doing. And the answers they got were mostly chart reviews and um, uh, naming and identifying problems, but not being involved in the solution implement implementation. And that was really our weak point. So with that, we started doing some work on, on trying to firm this up a little bit, and we've seen progress over a couple of years. So I drew this, made this diagram. Uh, this is how I think about trying to get the skill set out there. We've got our leaders trained. We've got our students having some familiarity, but not a lot of real-world experience. But in the middle, we had this huge cohort of current faculty and current GME, and for the time coming, still probably a good many GME uh, residents and fellows, who don't have that skill set. And we've got to figure out how do we get this uh, diffused into, uh, into our faculty who are out there teaching people. Because what will happen is that no matter what we teach people in the uh, medical school years, when they get in the real world, if they don't see people modeling behaviors that are um, supporting a culture of safety or modeling uh, in inqui inquisitiveness around uh, problem solving, uh, they're not likely to pick that up and they will be socialized to do what current faculty do. Uh, so we've been, uh, for the past two years, involved in a consortium through the American Medical Association uh, called Accelerating Change in Medical Education. And um, this is involving 32 schools that came in in three different waves over, uh, over the years. Um, our topic at Emory that we proposed was quality and safety across the medical education continuum. Uh, so this has been our, our theme, and we've been trying to get organized around it. So what we've been able to do at the UME level is to create a thread across the four years that instead of it just being me and a couple of other people who were asking permission to give a talk, uh, we now have this as part of the set curriculum. And I'll show you that uh, in just a moment. Uh, GME, we're still sorting through how to do this because of the challenges. But recognizing that our limitation has been faculty, we've got a faculty development program um, because we think that is the key. And down below, I've got a diagram of our most recent version of this faculty development course uh, that's about six months long. It starts with an application process and, and, um, and then kicks off with workshops in September. And then we do six workshops over the course of about five months, and then at the seventh, sixth month, the last time the people come, they do an oral presentation of the work they've done. Um, and then we've got another month for them to form, formulate that up into a poster for our Emory Quality Conference. The Quality Conference we've put on now for about seven or eight years. We bring in national speakers, celebrate the success we've had, um, but it's also a chance for us to showcase our own work. So we've combined for the past two years with the School of Medicine and we take all of the resident projects as well as the Emory Healthcare projects, and we even invite projects from the other uh, uh, affiliated hospitals. And we get about 125 posters a year, uh, and we let all of them be displayed and a chance to showcase the work. And it's at those conferences we've seen the quality of the work done by residents go from just a description of a problem now to some implementation and getting better. We're now measuring how much rigor is coming out of those projects. And I think uh, a lot of the posters are actually coming out of this uh, faculty development course. So in this faculty development course, here's how we do it. Uh, we invite, uh, we open it up to anyone uh, from any site, from any specialty. We invite them to submit an application with a project idea. 
Some of these are pretty well formed. Some of them are just in their infancy. We require that they name at least one interprofessional partner and that they have at least one trainee involved in the project. And when they come to our workshops, they can bring their entire team. So it's wonderful. In the room, we have about 40 people. Uh, we have a 15, 16, 17 faculty members running projects. Uh, but we have nurses and pharmacists and physical therapists, um, nursing students, medical students, public health students. Uh, it's really wonderful. Uh, we te co-teach it. There are four of us who are from the different sites who have quality improvement expertise, including the director of our quality scholars program at the VA. And we teach this, this all together. Um, each uh, project has a coach assigned, and so the teams meet with the coaches outside of the workshops. Our results has been a gain in confidence, and this graph to the right of the slide shows the pre-post uh, assessment of confidence in education. Still, uh, still the weak point in their quality improvement is their confidence in their ability to teach quality improvement. We thought we'd be graduating people who really felt like they could go out and do a curriculum, but they told us, no, we still need more practice with this. Uh, and I think that's true. They wanted more confidence. So we focused on helping them learn how to teach micro skills as opposed to develop an entire curriculum. But I think we'll work towards uh, where we have more robust uh, curricula out there in our GME world. One of our surgeons sent this quote that I really loved. After the first couple of weeks, um, he said, I'm going to have to miss the next workshop because I'm out of town, but let me just tell you, this has been fabulous, and I don't know who, who's, frankly, the learner here because my student is teaching me as much as I'm teaching them. It was a, it was a great uh, quote. For the undergraduate medical education, uh, this diagram just shows where we've got training across the four years. Uh, print is small, but you can see that um, it's a, uh, a mix of things. And we've been working to get some of these concepts a little earlier in the curriculum so that when students start into their clinical rotations, they're prepared with a framework to think about uh, the problems they see with healthcare delivery. Uh, so a few examples to illustrate for you. Um, uh, to speak about the value of an interprofessional team, uh, we've done a number of projects focused around um, performance on the quality and accountability scorecard and now also on the pay for performance uh, areas. So I don't know if you're involved in GPRO here as your Medicare for pay for performance or if you're doing something else, uh, but this is the group reporting uh, methodology. And uh, where we sh had a gap at Emory Healthcare was in our control of hypertension. We had a lot of patients whose most recent recorded blood pressure was outside of the, um, the expected range. Uh, so we, uh, our baseline performance was around 70% or so of hypertensive patients were in control. So we brought this team together, and the team included, uh, we, we were focusing primarily where blood pressure is being managed. So internal medicine, uh, nephrology, cardiology, geriatrics, those are the bulk of, uh, of clinics. So we have physicians from these areas come together with nursing leaders um, and with a data analyst and start going through uh, the, the problems. Uh, we generate a lot of ideas. Previous work in this area, one of our faculty members in the Department of Medicine has done work on this concept of clinical inertia where the physician is sitting with the patient, sees something out of control, but doesn't do anything because we talk ourselves into thinking, well, the patient's going to make lifestyle changes or um, this may just be a, an anomaly today. Uh, so we, the assumption going in was, well, the doctors aren't controlling blood pressure well. We went out and did a structured chart review, and what we found was that we, we hardly ever found a case that wasn't reasonable medical decision-making. That was not the cause. We did see a lot of times where a single blood pressure measurement was, was taken, and there was no repeat. And we all knew from experience that sometimes we remeasure it, and it's now uh, decreased. It's maybe may in the normal range again. So we wondered, partly, are we getting bad data coming in out of, the, out of our assessments. Um, the, we also noticed that occasionally the blood pressure was elevated and the physician didn't appear to have noticed it. And we you know, knew from personal experience that that can happen. I've seen that happen for me uh, as well. Um, and, uh, and so other things came out, including uh, patient adherence uh, was a well-known problem. And then uh, patient lost a follow-up. So the patient whose blood pressure is not controlled, and we say we want to see you in two months, but that was six months ago and they have no appointment scheduled. So these were the kinds of things we figured out. We started work really on these first two, and you can see from our graph the different things that we've done, and now we've got our performance up to about 80% of patients in control. So we've reduced it by a third, and this next wave will probably be turning ourselves to the lost follow-up. We're going to next look for patients 
who have a most recent blood pressure reading out of control who don't have a scheduled appointment in our system, and they'll be reaching out and scheduling those appointments and developing the infrastructure to do that. None of this is about trying harder as a doctor seeing a patient in the office. It's about building that teamwork uh, that can really drive uh, for better outcomes for patients. Uh, another interprofessional team that's done fabulous work has been our, our team that's provi that provides care for acute car uh, coronary syndromes. Uh, our STEMI team uh, started at first with work on the door to balloon time. They got that under great control. And then a few years ago, the metric changed to first medical contact to balloon time. So how, from the time an EMT shows up at the patient's home to the time the artery is open. Uh, and you can see from this graph, this is for each of our hospitals in the Emory Healthcare Network, um, how their performance has been. We were hitting this target in 2011 about 50 to 60% of the time on average. Um, and now we're up where um, but three of the four hospitals are consistently better than 75% of patients are hitting a 90-minute target. Uh, and that's the 90-minute uh, target is uh, what's set in the 75 uh, percent threshold is set by the American Heart Association uh, for their Mission Lifeline uh, awards. So this has been great work by an interprofessional team that had to partner up with uh, area uh, emergency medical transport and figure out how do we get the EKGs faxed from the field and what and do we allow uh, you know the faxed EKG read by the ER doc to activate the cath lab. All those kinds of uh, questions have been uh, answered by this team. Um, Abby Goyle, who's our cardiologist, who is the physician lead for quality for the system uh, in cardiology, um, is also working on uh, appropriate use criteria. And this graph is just uh, showing us how we were um, having as many as 20 to 25 percent of patients going to heart catheterization who did not meet established criteria. And some of that was the documentation. Some of it, frankly, was that they weren't even thinking about it. They were just taking them to the cath lab. And at a referral center, we did have some physicians, some of our cardiologists who said, if I've got a, you know, a doctor in the community who wants this patient catheterized, I'm not going to second guess them. I'm going to do it for them. And other cardiologists would say, well, but if it's not really appropriate, I would pick up the phone and call them. So we're working through those sorts of uh, those sorts of variations in, in practice, as well as getting the, the decision support in place and the documentation in place. So Dr. Goyle has built decision support into the cardiology notes, helping give them the criteria, but also prompting them to record it. And now we're down to where less than 5% of patients don't, have, uh, don't meet appropriate use criteria. Um, in terms of trying to give feedback to the average uh, doctor about performance, uh, going back as many years as I was at Emory, every month um, our practice would get the uh, profit and loss statement. I don't know if you all look at those regularly, but it tends to be uh, a one piece of paper with very small font. And you look in the bottom right-hand corner, and there's a, a number that's bold, and it either is, uh, has brackets around it or not. You don't want the brackets because that's, that's your negative balance. Um, so we were seeing that data regularly. That sends the message that productivity and revenue generation is what matters. Well, that does matter. You have to keep the lights on. No money, no mission. But that was the data people were used to looking at. Uh, and so what we want to do is to provide a more comprehensive set of data around the things that matter. So in the Department of Medicine, we started this about two years ago, first in primary care. And now I'm happy to say over the last six months, every physician at Emory Healthcare in the Department of Medicine gets a monthly scorecard or monthly report. We call it a scorecard. We've, we've changed it now to a report uh, because we're not keeping score. We want to try to get feedback. It's got the productivity metrics, satisfaction, patient access, and quality. And what we did uh, is we took this on as a department. We said, this isn't coming from healthcare administration. This is us to us as a department. What do we want to see to manage our practice? And we worked with the physician groups uh, to put the quality measures on there that mattered to them. Uh, and we started with things that were of interest to the entire organization, but then we were able to customize it to, to what mattered to them. Uh, it's really important when you're bringing data like this to frame it right, because everybody, when, you, when they start seeing data sent to them, wonder, how is this going to be used? Are people judging me by this? We all judge ourselves, but is somebody else judging me by it? And if I'm worried someone's judging me, my response to data may be defensive, and I can start thinking of all the reasons why it might not be correct. Instead, what we try to do with this is to say, here's, some, here's data that we have available. You should be able to see it. Um, it might generate some ideas for, for where we need to put focus. How do we need to work together 
uh, to improve things. And so we're trying to use it for learning. Uh, we also have to validate it. So if someone says, I don't think that's right, we go back and we, we drill it down and make sure that we're measuring what we think we're measuring. Uh, and then if it's correct, we come back to them and tell them why it's correct. If it's not, we found some real errors in our data uh, and out of this because people would challenge the data. And we, we thanked them for it. We came back and made it right for them. So I think if you're going to bring data to people, you want to, you want to do it in this way. Otherwise, uh, it just goes into the uh, delete uh, the wastebasket. Uh, so a little work around standardization through some of our projects. Uh, my colleague, uh, David Murphy, is a fabulous critical care physician who trained um, at uh, Hopkins under Peter Pronovost, who uh, leads their safety, Armstrong Safety Institute there. Um, and David uh, did this work on trying to reduce uh, the variation in giving uh, albumin in our ICUs. Uh, and in our, in our ORs is what they're going to tackle next. But the ICUs, uh, there was huge variation across, by different providers across different conditions. And uh, they knew from the literature that uh, for a lot of conditions, there wasn't really an evidence base that albumin was better. Uh, and it's also a very, very high cost. Uh, so he wanted to really understand how do, they, how do they decrease albumin use and also make sure that we're not harming patients uh, in this and to measure the effect that different strategies could have. So one strategy that they had um, toyed with and had actually used in a previous project to reduce x-rays and blood gases and whatnot uh, is to incentivize people. So year one was an incentive program. They put some money behind it. So what they said is we expect to save some money. Uh, we're going to put some of that money into an incentive program. And they did. So year one was incentives. And incentives primarily just get focus, get people to be thinking about it so they're conscientious and thoughtful about what they order. Um, in year two, by year two, uh, they had done the work to develop consensus, review the evidence, where's their evidence for albumin use, um, and get consensus around what we're going to use it for. And then they built a decision support tool into the order in our electronic medical records so that when you're ordering albumin, you give the indication for it as well. They've done this with transfusion now also, and it's really helped our uh, transfusion rate. So that's year two. The outcomes uh, were the frequency of albumin orders, cost, and mortality. Uh, so this was the incentive payout. Not huge, but it can get people's attention. Um, our utilization, here's the, um, uh, the criteria they agreed to. Uh, for utilization that ended up being built into the um, electronic health record. Uh, the patient population before intervention and after were very similar. Um, after, if anything, there were a few more patients who had uh, met criteria for sepsis, a few more who had um, uh, uninsur no insurance or public insurance, uh, but generally the, the two groups are comparable. Um, so the outcomes on albumin use uh, showed a decrease of uh, depending on how you're measuring it, 10 to 40 percent. So a significant decrease in albumin use. Um, and here are the graphs uh, showing the number of orders, probability of any order, and mean number of orders, and uh, just what was happening. So you see that every category is drifting down over the two years of the study. Uh, so what was our uh, mortality measure? Uh, overall, mortality did not change in the ICUs over the, over the period they were doing this. Um, and uh, what was the economic output? So we know that we reduced use. Uh, we have here a decrease across all patients, those who did and did not get albumin use, of, of nearly $300 per ICU per patient uh, admission. Uh, and for those who were getting albumin, it was about $1,000 less for those who were treated. So the overall direct savings of this were $2.5 million in albumin purchases. And the way hospitals are paid, you don't get extra for giving albumin. It's all one DRG. Uh, and then the total incentive payouts were about 80000 bucks. So the net was $2.4 million in savings. Um, so this is real money. It comes back to our ability to uh, you know, reinvest in the things that we need to take care of patients and uh, potentially invest in things like future quality improvement projects. So out of this, they were looking at common practice variation, people doing what they thought was right for the patient, but realizing that amongst all the expertise in the ICUs, um, there are some practices still that are probably better than others. And they need to share that learning, come to consensus on it. Um, and by reducing variation, you, you, did, you, need, you need to monitor health outcomes. But generally, when you reduce variation, health outcomes, if anything, stay flat or improve. And a lot of times they're improving because if the thing we're doing doesn't add value, we're exposing them to additional risk. Um, so it both reduced uh, cost as well as exposure to uh, um, uh, a medication. 
Uh, one last word on variation. Uh, this is an example um, that's really common, uh, and you'll all recognize it. A few years ago, there was a nice study done in the VA system nationally to look at variation in antibiotic prescribing for upper respiratory illnesses, acute upper respiratory illnesses. So everything from otitis media to sore throat, sinusitis, um, common cold, and bronchitis. So all those got lumped together, about 10 different ICD-9 codes. Um, and they found uh, across the VA system huge variation. So I brought that article to my data analyst, and um, who's fabulous, and I said, uh, do you think we can reproduce this out of our data warehouse? And the next morning, she sent me a spreadsheet. And she had done it um, overnight uh, throughout our system. Uh, we have since, you know, that was just before we switched over to ICD-10. So the graph I'm showing you here is how we've reproduced this now uh, in ICD-10 because we had to map those codes over. So each dot is an individual physician. The y-axis is the likelihood that if you present to them with one of these diagnoses, you'll walk away with a prescription for an antibiotic. And the range is from 5% to 95%. The x-axis is the volume of patients with one of those diagnoses they saw in the previous year. And it ranges from about 15 on the low end, because there's people like me who are in clinic half day a week, um, all the way up to um, um, 300 on the high end for people who are just super high volume uh, with uh, fairly low acuity. Uh, the colors are their practice sites. And what we noticed when we did this, um, it actually reflects the uh, learning that comes out of the Dartmouth Atlas, is that people practice medicine as they see it practiced around them. We normalize to our peers. Um, and we also, by doing that, we're, you know, if our peers are doing something, they're teaching the patients to expect that. Uh, and so what we have are practice clusters where at any one site, uh, you'll see um, uh, variation there, but uh, there's a mean that's different. So our lowest prescribing site is about 25% of patients. And this is actually the resident clinic in my practice. 25% of patients walk out with an antibiotic with one of these diagnoses. Um, whereas you go to some of our other practice sites and the average is about 70% of patients. The overall average here is around 60%. Uh, but the range is tremendous. So what's interesting with this is that um, I, I went to, before I shared it with anybody, I was uh, at a noon uh, changeover in resident clinic, um, and I was there with the two faculty from the morning and, I, and me and my colleague who were going to staff for the afternoon. And I said, uh, I got some interesting data. It's the rate at which when patients come in with uh, respiratory illnesses, we each prescribe antibiotics. And they got quiet and they, they said, ooh, can we see? And I said, sure. So I put the graph up. Their jaws hit the floor was the first response. And then the second question was what? Where am I? Where am I? They wanted to know. Um, and I was able to point, I, I knew which dots were theirs, and I would point to the dots, and they expressed relief because they were not on the high end. <laughs> our, our practice, our practice, what's interesting, our practice of the faculty alone is about 45% prescribing, but the residents who come, in our, come to our practice and we're supervising them is 25%. So very, very interesting. Um, so I think here's, here's an example of variation that exists that we didn't know about until we had the data to look at it. Uh, but now we have to ask ourselves, what's right? I don't know what the right number is. Nobody knows what the right number is. But it sure as heck isn't 95%. And in fact, our current, our department chair, um, who is now the interim dean, uh, when I put this up for our department leaders to say, here's something we're going to be focusing on this next year, um, he said, how can this be? He's an infectious disease specialist. Uh, he says, how, how can this be? We've got to get a hold of this. And so I asked him, what do you think's right, David? What's the right number? He said, 15, 20 percent. You know, that's just his gut instinct. So if we take the, um, the Infectious Disease Society of America's uh, guidelines um, and put them into effect, we'll probably see it drop pretty dramatically. So we're going to be bringing this data back to our physicians. Um, but here's the impact on teamwork that I want to tell you about. So um, about a week after I showed this uh, slide to a group of our primary care leaders, um, I got, a, got an email from the nurse who's in charge of our call center. And when patients, we have a centralized call center, Patient calls in uh, asking for an appointment or with a clinical issue or for a refill or whatever. So if they call in and say, I've got this cold, the nurses have uh, an algorithm that's evidence-based um, that comes out of an, a published book that we've approved, and they kind of work through that. And if it's the kind of thing where they can do self-care at home, uh, the nurse will give that advice. 
But the problem was that the patients won't accept that advice because they say, gee, my doctor always prescribes me an antibiotic. In fact, if you just tell them I'm sick, they'll probably call it in. Uh, so they get that sort of response. And what that leads to is the nurses can't use the algorithm uh, because the patients won't accept it. So what happens? You book the patient an appointment. Right? Um, and what that leads to is not only wasted nursing time, they didn't need to spend their time on the phone triaging that patient if they're just going to book them an appointment. Unnecessary visits. So it actually cuts down our access. And, of course, if we see them, uh, some of our physicians are going to prescribe antibiotics um, in, a, in uh, a way that's vastly overusing it. So this is the kind of stuff that we're, that we're now starting to work on a more granular level. This particular um, measure is not hard to do out of, a, out of electronic data, uh, and it's actually data the insurance companies have. They know what we billed for, and they know whether they paid for a prescription for an antibiotic. Uh, and so it's, it's becoming one of the quality measures that some of our insurance payers want to see us track and improve on. So we're going to be trying to get ahead of the game here and doing some work to roll out um, this next year. Feedback, uh, education, and perhaps some decision support around variation. So the variation gets in the way of the ability to have a real interprofessional team. Uh, so to come back to my learning objectives for you, I didn't hit these head on, but let me try to uh, uh, bring it to you. So how do we prioritize opportunities for improvement? I think there's two perspectives. One is, how do you simply choose the right project? As uh, I heard yesterday and agree with, we live in a target-rich environment. There's a lot of stuff that we can be improving. So one thing is that we really need to understand what are our system and um, departmental goals? What are the priorities that we see in the system. Because if we choose a project that aligns with that, now we're more likely to get other people in the room from other health professions. We might get leadership support, we might get facilitation, we might have data coming to us. So try to link it up with, um, uh, with goals. Uh, but, but also, when you get into a project, the other perspective is which of the things within what we're finding as problems here, uh, which, uh, what solutions should we try? Well, this is where the quality improvement techniques come in. Rather than shoot from the hip, let's really analyze uh, and let's uh, choose something wisely. In terms of, a, of the success factors, I've, I've tried to show you how an interprofessional team really does have the opportunity to improve success at improvement. But I think the other thing is we have to have, we have to be intentional about how the improvement work is going to be done, give the team time to do it, figure out how to build that in. In my practice some years ago, in fact, before 2006, um, we had a lot of people who were demoralized, um, unhappy with our practice, feeling like they were victims of, um, of the scheduling system and everything else. And it was really upsetting. Uh, so what we did was to, um, a couple of us got together and said, we need to try to change this. So we went to the administration and we said, can we get from you an hour a week to, do, to work on improving what we're doing? And they said, sure. We'd love, we, we, you know, thank you for coming and asking to be engaged. They didn't think we cared. And so they gave us an hour per week of lost productivity, an average of three appointments per physician we weren't going to see. Uh, so we took that hour per week and we started doing improvement work. And we were in our infancy. We, we were clumsy. We didn't do it well. We didn't make a lot of progress, but we saw some progress. But what changed dramatically was our attitudes. We were now involved in taking control. Um, and the other interesting thing was that after about six months, the um, clinic administrator came to me and he said, I thought you were going to take some time out of practice to do improvement work. And I said, oh, we have been. We've taken an hour a week. And he says, well, your productivity hasn't changed. Yet we didn't see any, any loss. And what was happening was that we were gaining little efficiencies and we were making up in the week those three appointments lost per doc on average. Uh, and nobody was trying to make those up. They just made, up, made them up. So we did see some improvements. Um, so taking that time out, having leadership support, having facilitation are keys to good success. Mm -hmm. And then I think the unnecessary variation, we have to take it on because if we don't take it on, the effects are lower value care, spending $2.4 million in excess albumin that's not uh, changing patient outcomes is not a wise thing to do. Um, and also we have suboptimal team function. By managing variation... Now we can offload some of those things that, as a doctor, I don't need to do. Right? I don't need to order a mammogram ever. My patient should just get it if they meet criteria. We ought to have a conversation if they have questions about it, but, but I don't need to do that ordering. Same with immunizations. If they're eligible, let's just make it happen. Uh, so we need, to, we need to do those things so that we can devote our attention, our intellect, to solving the problems our patients need solved. And that, I think, will be more engaging for us, too. So thank you for your time and attention. Let me stop, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions if you have questions.
take me that was great. Uh, one question I have is on that graph that David Stevens also asked, who, where am I on that list? So David was not on the list okay. for two reasons. One is it was primary care because I was trying to mirror the VA um, uh, thing. And, and honestly, our infectious disease specialists aren't seeing common colds, not very often at all. So, um, you know, they, they weren't there. So on a serious note, so we are, every institution is in a different stage of evolution. Uh, and we are, you were in 2006 thinking about this, but in 2010, you started seeing an explosion of this interest. Yeah. We're not there yet. Okay. Do you have a sense of what is the investment of an organization when you, has the organization thought about time protection, leadership meetings, mm -hmm. uh, investment in attracting like the 80K for the doctors that right. turn out into a 2.4 million? Because at the end for, for administration, the department chairs and deans, one of the questions is, this is great, but if it's going to kill my opportunity to take care of the HIV program, for example, because I can't afford it, then that's a problem. So one question is, is there a sense of how much of the revenue organization should be reinvested back in? And number two, how do you sustain what works? Right, right. Great questions, because I think those are, those are the real leadership questions at the top, and the top has to be uh, fully on board with this. So uh, I think at first, it's a little bit of a step of faith because, you know, at least uh, Dave Murphy was able to measure hard dollars with the albumin expense. But so much of what we do in, in quality, it's hard to, harder to measure uh, and put into dollar amounts. Uh, so it is a bit of a step of faith to say if we are improving efficiency and effectiveness, we will see um, hopefully it's revenue neutral or even uh, revenue producing down the road. Uh, organizations that have gotten sophisticated about it also build um, the ability to really track what's happening, and they expect a return on investment. Uh, and we're starting to do this now with one program called our Value Acceleration Program. A few years ago, we were doing the math on what, um, the, what Medicare spending, what Medicare is saying it's doing with reimbursement, and what we're knowing was happening in the commercial marketplace. And as an organization, Emory Healthcare back then was had a uh, you know net uh, gross revenue of more than $2.6 billion in a, per year. Uh, but of that, we were projecting that over several years, reimbursements would decline by about $200 million. So our CEO said, we need to set a goal of figuring out how to get $200 million out of our operating costs. Um, about half of that was focused on non-clinical areas, uh, but the other half was, was clinical. And so the value acceleration program on the clinical side um, went after uh, places where we thought there was a return on investment, and we're actually measuring that return uh, so uh, the return can be measured, for example, uh, in a surgery on length of stay. Because our biggest cost uh, for patients, uh, patient care that's variable is labor, so length of stay. And plus, if you get the bed open, you now can put the next patient in the bed, you get another DRG payment. Uh, so we are, we are tracking on these value acceleration programs. Uh, when we put into place, uh, we, we, we have physician leaders, nursing leaders, they come together with um, a facilitator and a data analyst, uh, and they get into um, you know, a particular type of surgery, Cardiac stenting has been done, uh, a variety of other things. And, and together they figure out where might be their, the variable costs that we could take out. Some of it's in supplies and standardization. Some of it's in uh, standardizing the care program so you can reduce length of stay. Um, and we've, we've seen, um, I forget how many millions of dollars, but several tens of millions over the past two years. And we keep doing an additional three or four projects per quarter that add to that. So uh, we, we're now at the point where we're trying to target where we think there's a return because it is a big cost. We've got at least uh, three full-time salaries in that program trying to facilitate and drive that. Um, I think on the, uh, on the other end, what we have to do is, uh, you know, for, when it comes to things like physician time, uh, we, we have to figure out how do we not make it penalize the physicians. So the example in my practice, as physicians, we could have lost the revenue of those three patients a week we ended up not losing it uh, because it, we did get the gains. Uh, and I think that that's, that's part of the equation. But in a fee-for-service world, if we're compensating our physicians by productivity, we have to keep the eye on that. And I think as we start moving to these kinds of contracts that are being more, more population health-based and outcomes-based, uh, we need to recognize that taking the time out of work is essential to get the health outcomes that actually do pay us in the future. Uh, so that becomes another way. And then we'll, our compensation models for physicians will start to shift 
towards including those patient outcomes. And we're already doing that now. There's, um, with these quality measures I put out there, uh, the physician bonus, the variable pay, is linked to, the, to their quality performance, whether it's at the individual level or the practice level. Yeah. Uh, how many different uh, systems rate hospitals? And the case in point is two days ago on the front page of our newspaper, several hospitals that I use had D ratings. But obviously, a lot of what you just told us is a way to try to dig out of that D rating. But is right. D-Prob a valid one, or is our newspaper just picking that to shoot so, bullets at CEOs? That's, that's a great question, too. And I, I don't have the slides with me, but there are... Um, there have been a number of articles published that use the same data coming from these different rating systems. And MedPAR data is the Medicare data that you can, anybody can purchase. You can do purchase it for research. You can purchase it if you're a leapfrog or health grades or anybody else. Um, and what they do is they compare how hospitals rank in these different rating systems. And what you find is that um, they, they, they don't correlate. So any rating system, you know, you can look high, you can look low. And so LeapFrog is, is one that's, you know, put out, uh, started by the business roundtable uh, coming from uh, purchasers primarily of insurance, uh, whereas Health Grades is its own commercial business, and then Consumer Reports is doing things, and Medicare has its rating systems. Um, I think with, uh, you know, with UHC, we felt like it was the one that was most true to uh, what we felt was valid data and could be measured. And in fact, it was at the academic health centers agreeing together that the best evidence for measurement is here. So that's why we, we use that as our benchmark, because we believed in it. Uh, and I think the good thing is if you're choosing one thing to benchmark against, you can see your own performance over time. Because you know how you did before, you know how you do in the future. But for inter-hospital comparison, it's all garbage for the most part. Yeah. So you pointed out there in the talk that in many circumstances it's much easier to identify an issue than it is to rectify it. So mm -hmm. I'm from endocrinology. We did a QI project where we looked at uh, amiodarone treated patients and we looked to see how often the PSH is measured with the guidelines. So right. I once every six or 12 months because hypothyroidism is more hyperthyroidism is very dangerous and cardiomyopathy patients. And of course, the compliance with that is very small. So these were right. reminders. So every division and every field has its guidelines with reminders. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get a letter from the insurance company, Mrs. So-and-so has diabetes, but you're not treating under the statin. So how do you deal with reminders? Uh, I think, you know, the reminders are, they're kind of the easiest thing to do, right? It's uh, fairly simple and straightforward. But think about all the different potential things in your day. If you add up for every patient all the potential things that they might need, there's no way that you could keep track of those. And in fact, there's been you know, estimates from the family practice literature that if you did nothing but focus on preventive care as a primary care doc, that would consume all but about 15 minutes of your day for your patients. You know, and, and leaving just the 15 minutes to handle the things that were you know, on their agenda. Uh, so there's no way that we can potentially pay attention to everything. And uh, I think the reminders, it's a quick patch. But we've got to get to the place where we redesign how we practice. And we have to get off of this model of all of this is on the doctor. So that sort of thing, you know, you shouldn't be putting brain power to remembering that the TSH is necessary. This is where our electronic health records uh, need to grow and be, uh, they're, they're very immature still. They catalog a lot of information. Uh, they don't effectively remind us, or if they start reminding us about everything, it overwhelms us and it's all noise. Uh, so we need, to, we need to both have the um, surveillance systems and electronic records that can take care of that for us, and the team that can take care of it. So we're now doing, for a number of chronic diseases, including diabetes, uh, in our medical home uh, in particular, we have pre-visit planning, and we have a data warehouse stream that says, okay, for these patients coming in this week, here's everything they're due for. And it's the medical assistant and the nurse who tee all that up. Uh, and then when the patient arrives, uh, they've got the list to, to say, okay, and I, I'm a patient there, so they'll go through and say, okay, Dr. Spell, you're, you're due for this, 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 and this. Uh, Dr. Higdon, my doctor, may, may talk to you about those things, but we'll be prepared to order those blood samples and, and, and then test and everything else. And so when I get in the room with my doc, he doesn't need to focus on all those things. He just said, is everything clear from what the medical assistant told you? So that's, that's the sort of teamwork we need to ultimately get to where this, these things happen reliably and automatically. And, you know, we as physicians ought to modify it. You know, so if I'm, 
just got diagnosed with metastatic cancer, the preventive care no longer matters much. Even though I'm due for it, let's focus on what matters. You, if you're my doctor, you should go that direction and forget about, you know, just cancel all those automated things. But, uh, but take that burden off of us. That's, that's my, my answer. That's a long-term solution. One last question. Yeah. At an organizational level, these are often multi-year projects. Mm -hmm. The product line they may be shorter than a particular clinic or a process. That right. Means. One of the problems you run into is residents choosing to engage. They're doing their own project. They're limited by a bigger right. time they're here. How do you deal with that? We're trying to get, we want to get them engaged in the bigger projects. Uh, we want them to have, you know, the nice thing about them choosing their project is they're invested in that because they cho chose it. But it's, it tends to lead to those superficial solutions that they can manage. And uh, we're, we're trying every chance we get to get the learners involved. So we, we've got now the kind of the catalog of all the different projects we're doing. And just like with our faculty development course, we, whenever a project is chartered, we ask, is there an opportunity to get a learner involved or multiple learners? And some of these have really uh, done, done fabulous at it. We had one project where uh, urology wanted to um, standardize their order set for uh, management of their uh, bladder cancer patients after you know, around surgery to, for cystectomy because they have a lot of complications, very high readmission rate. Um, and one of their third year urology residents ran that project did a fabulous job. The faculty member advised. He did all the work and just uh, did a stellar job. So we're, we're, taking, we're trying to push on that every chance we get. But what that means is that um, not every resident will get deep into a project, only those that really want that immersion. Uh, and, the, and the departments have to be willing to make it happen for them. They have to make it possible for them. Thank you.